All right, all right. Welcome to Savvy Sabs Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Nico House. He's the host of For the People Podcast. You may remember him during other election cycles. Welcome back, Nico. Hey, Sabs, great to be back. Thanks for having me. Hey, what is, what is going on, man? Because I know um, for those who are not aware, like Nico and I were just talking about this because you have already had experience uh, covering news during an election cycle. This is my first time covering news during an election cycle. And it's, it's crazy, like chaotic now, because like, I just, obviously I was just on vacation and I feel like everything happened while I was gone. The Hulk Hogan thing at the RNC convention, JD Vance, which we'll get into in a little bit, but I feel like everything was breaking just one after another, bam, 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 bam. bam. How do you, how did you deal with all that in the past? Uh, it, it, it didn't, I mean, I dealt with it. I don't know if you, I don't know if you would call it like in a healthy way. Like I was keeping up with the news cycle. I was only getting about four or five hours of sleep. Uh, for those of you who remember back in the day, I would start streaming at times at 7 a.m. Do a two hour stream in the morning, uh, cover breaking news during the day. I would release clips during the day and then do maybe another hour at night. But for some live stream, it was, I had to, I couldn't do that anymore. I had to stop because it was, it's wearing me down, but the, the election cycle last time was chaotic in and of itself because we had right the the rigging, which was obvious. There were so many candidates, and this you got to remember. You actually, I don't know if you want to call it fortunate or unfortunate because you're a journalist, but you didn't have to go through a, a primary. Remember, there was a whole primary in 2020 on both sides of the fence, really, uh, and so we had to deal with that for a year before we even got to this point. So yeah, it, I didn't deal with it that well, I, I burned out. I, I'll tell you, that's what really happened is I burned out by the end of it all. Uh, so I learned my lesson and now I, I, I deal with it in, in parts and I, I handle what I can and I, and I trust that my colleagues can handle the rest when I don't get to. All right. All right. And that brings me to, yeah, for those who don't know, who may be newer, uh, we started like those of us at RBM, we started in 2021. So it was after uh, the election season, it was after, you know, Trump lost. So we missed all of that. I mean, we were watching independent media, but we didn't cover any of that. So we started during a time when there really just wasn't a lot of, of movement, uh, in the political space. Now we still had news to cover because crazy things happened during a uh, Biden's administration, but now it's just like, go, 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 go. Like it's crazy right now. And then I never thought I'd have to deal with, uh, uh, the presidential candidate uh, choosing not to run for re-election. So there's that too. It's crazy. Uh, so the funny thing is y'all started exactly whenever people need to be paying attention the most. That's what makes what you guys did so great is because there are a lot of, this is one of those, the, the few times that I was actually kind of like disengaged because I was dealing with family stuff. And so, uh, but a lot of people just don't really want to cover Biden. And I knew that that was going to happen. They didn't want to cover Biden because you had people that were considering themselves quote unquote Biden bros inventing reasons as to why it's okay to try and support him or at least not criticize him uh, overtly and focus even at that point still on Trump rather than uncovering the neoconservative policies of Biden. And now you see people, you saw people flip during the Gaza situation and now you're seeing them flip back you know, to get behind calmly because of that time of year again. But because y'all were there from the beginning, a lot of your audience they're already privy to the cycle because y'all were there since everybody stopped paying attention. But the people who knew like, this is when we're supposed to start paying attention because they're gonna start passing stuff that we're not paying attention to. And y'all were covering it. That's why, you know, RBN gets a lot of love now. Yeah, I was gonna tell people like, uh, for those that started, uh, I would say, well, actually, uh, some people started during Bernie 2016, but for those who started like during the 2020 election, if you started during that time, like you had, uh, you had it from both sides, right? Because Trump was always trending. He gave a lot of ratings to corporate media. I think that's why they were kind of like, oh, Trump's gone. And now all of a sudden our ratings are going down. He gave them a lot of ratings. And then at the same time, you had the Bernie, another Bernie campaign, which there was a lot of momentum around that. Uh, and then all the many candidates that ran in that primary. So if you started during that time, like you, I think that was a, a good time for people to start. And I think with us, because we started after that, it was just kind of like, people are like, okay, Biden won. I'm done. I don't want to pay attention to electoral politics right now. I don't want to do 
us <laughs> down. And but that's how you build up the right audience, though. You build up a good audience. Yeah, you're right. The other way, doing it the other way, yeah, it might build you, bring you more people quicker. But the problem is, you're building off of a brand on somebody else's brand. Y'all built off of RBN. They built up off of Bernie or being a Democrat or being a you know faux aggressive or you know a latte liberal. But y'all actually built up off of no, we're going to cover what we're going to cover, and this is this is our stance, and this is where we're going to stand on our business, and that's not going to change. Because y'all, we didn't get famous from covering Bernie, nor did we get famous from uh, Trump derangement syndrome. We you just got popular telling it like it is. And so that audience is, you know, stuck around. And now more people are getting to hear you because the election has changed. But y'all stances have only really evolved and improved uh, more than anything, which we can't say for a lot of our colleagues at this moment. So <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Well, that that brings us to J.D. Vance, because this is something that I missed when I was on vacation. He was announced as Donald Trump's VP pick. This guy, like, uh, I want to start with the kids and the taxes clips. I got a couple of clips I want to show, and I want to get your take on this, Nico, because he is saying just the craziest shit. So this is J.D. Vance on Charlie Kirk's show, and I want you guys to hear what he says about people that don't have kids. Listen to this. Well, I'll go back to something I said earlier about we need to reward the things that we think are good and punish the things that we think are bad. So you talk about tax policy. Let's tax the things that are bad and not tax the things that are good. If you're making $100,000, $400,000 a year, and you've got three kids, you should pay a different lower tax rate than if you're making the same amount of money and you don't have any kids. It's that simple. You know, well, so, Nico. Your taxes are already different if you have three kids with that amount of money, so I don't know if he knows that. I'm sure he does. So. He's, so he's basically saying that people that don't have kids should have to pay more taxes. And I'm like, so we have to yeah. be punished because like that. Uh, That's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous thing. <laughs> it's, and what's even crazier is because, so let's just say you don't make $400,000. Just say you make $80,000, right? Because for some reason he's focused on $400,000, which is like a whole, that's an insane number. Most Americans are like, what? Why are we even talking about that? That's not, nothing to do with me. But like, those Midwestern people who are making 60, 70, $80,000, who are making just enough that the government takes taxes from them during the year and during tax season, we're gonna punish them because they decided to have a nuclear family. I thought that the whole reason, or excuse me, that they just, because they decided not to have a traditional nuclear family, I thought that we wanted to reduce the amount of pressure we're putting on the government. I thought that's what, like, we want small government. That's what I thought, you know, if you're a conservative. But if you're telling me I'm going to have more kids, having more kids means I can be protected by the government. I can get tax. I can, you know, get more tax credits or evade taxes that I would otherwise pay. Like you're going to encourage people to, be, uh, to enter situations that it's putting more pressure on pe single people and people who decide not to have kids for what? Just because they chose a different lifestyle. That's ludicrous. Yeah, that's that's insane. Um, oh, yeah. Nico, can you turn up your volume by chance? Uh, yeah, I can do it. Definitely do that. Hold on. <laughs> Someone said in the chat. I didn't is know it, if it was. Is it, how do you, how can, you, can you hear me now? Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, like, I, I just don't think it's fair to like <laughs> punish people because they don't have kids. And then also too, it's like this guy to me, it almost feels like he's saying things like this on purpose. And I have a couple other clips to show too. Yeah. Uh, but it, it does just seem really weird. I also have heard from some conservative, like, some conservatives that are Trump supporters, that they're not happy about this pick. A lot of conservatives are not happy about this pick. Um, and it seems like he's out to intentionally sabotage Trump. Uh, people don't really think, they think that, no, nah, Trump wouldn't fall. Yeah, yeah, he would. He literally would. I mean, Trump does not, the thing that has made Trump popular is also his biggest fault. He doesn't understand politics, nor does he understand the game. Like, he doesn't understand the gamesmanship of politics. So, there is a good possibility that this guy was selected for Trump because he was not even in the top five of his VP candidates. And so whenever J.D. Vance, a person who was literally a never Trump guy, was announced, everybody was extremely confused.
Yeah. And speaking of him not being a Trump guy, I do have that clip as well. Uh, this is when uh, J.D. Vance was on CNN. Yes, he was on CNN before. I think you guys need to hear this because not only does he speak out against Trump, but he speaks in support of voting third party. This is the what this is some wild stuff. This is uh, August 29th, 2016. And they played this clip from the Matt Jones podcast. Listen to this. I cannot stand Trump because I think he's a fraud. <laughs> well, I think he's a total fraud that is exploring these I people who is a total fraud that I, I agree with you on trump because i don't think that he's the person i i, I don't think he actually cares about folks but i i, I think that that i i'm i'm gonna vote for i'm gonna vote third party because i can't stomach trump i think that he's noxious and is leading the white working class to a very dark place I like also that was super weird that he just went straight to the white working class <laughs> like yeah just just the white working class but also too like so that's him agreeing with Matt Jones that he feels like Donald Trump is a fraud. There's been other video clips, too, where he was not a fan of Trump, apparently. And then also that. But he said he was thinking about voting third party. It does not yeah, make any with, sense that he would pick this guy. It's what it, he comes off like a chameleon. That it's ironic that he's calling Trump a fraud because he comes off like a chameleon because there are people who have tried to put J.D. Vance in this populist category. And what like, I'm not seeing, it. I don't understand where they're getting this idea. That he's a, he, everything that he said has either been hyper conservative or uh, no, just just hyper conservative. Even the where I thought that he might have been decent at, right, which was the situation in Ukraine. I just watched a speech with him where he refers to Putin as a dictator. And this is just a, a false on his face. He has a legislature. He has a matter of fact. A lot of people in Russia argue that Putin can't do as much as he would like to do because he actually has a bureaucracy that he has to go through in order to get things done. Unlike the rest of the West, who just kind of does what the, you know, what their elites tell them to do, what their corporations tell them to do. So even the things that I thought that he'd be decent at, he's not really showing that he's even better than Trump on those issues because a VP is supposed to improve uh, in areas that your president may lack in. He's not bringing anybody into the into that base. I don't even I feel like he could be scaring voters away. Um and and he, like a, how do you even open up a tax conversation if you're making like $400,000? Who the hell in Ohio or Indiana or Illinois like I mean yeah, maybe Chicago, but like the majority of the states that he's supposed to help Trump win, who's relating to that? Why is that even a conversation? And millennials, which Trump needs, even Trump was winning with millennials. Now we know millennials there's, there's very few of us that can afford to have kids, right? That's just the reality of the situation. And there's very few Gen Z who are looking forward to have kids because they're looking at our situation like, damn, they got messed up and they got somewhat of a head start. We're really screwed. How is that winning the young voter? So there have been rumors that Chuck Schumer, uh, oh no, excuse me, there have been Chuck, there have been rumors that Trump is thinking about replacing Vance, or at least at least unhappy with Vance. And Chuck Schumer came out and said that he has about 10 days officially to replace him. I don't think that'll happen. Uh, and Trump campaign has come out and fervently denied that. But I believe due to the lack of appearances that I I've seen with them together, that it is highly plausible that Trump is trying to disassociate from him. Because well, he isn't being asked any about anything that J.D. Vance is saying. No, that that makes that makes sense from what I've seen, because I also have this one from Simon Ataba. I don't know if you follow him on Twitter, uh, Nico, but he's a trip. But he had this oh, clip. Oh, I do follow him, actually. He follows you follow him. Is he funny? Yeah. Yeah, he, he posted this clip. It says, J.D. Vance's roommate during their time at Yale Law School. So I want you guys to hear a little bit of this. This was his oh, roommate another at Yale. one? Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, yeah, I got to hear that. Look, they went, all the, they went all the way back to, they're, they're finding multiple roommates that he has had, I guess. That's because they, they're that's basically what they do. Just trying to Yeah. They're trying to prove they're like, this guy is, there's something up with him. Listen to this guy. Go. Now, you you, you put out this um, this uh, text message he sent, which uh, where he called Trump America's Hitler, something that I think there are people out there who relate to. Um, but I guess the question I have is, do you think he still believes that and he's just okay with it now? Or what's your assessment? What it seems like is that unlike a lot of Republican politicians who I think you could characterize as just empty suits, 
who will say whatever they need to uh, to be powerful. JD has allowed some deeper anger to motivate him here. Mm. Um, that was something that I could sense a little bit when I knew him as a roommate. I mean, obviously, he was skeptical of the law school environment. He's written about that. But he had a very caustic sense of humor uh, behind closed doors about some of the students and events at uh, Yale. And that's one of the reasons we didn't get along so well, because uh, I didn't want to make my identity, you know, this kind of uh, defined in opposition to the law school environment. I mean, I was in, I, I ran the comedy show there. I was having a pretty good time. Uh, and so what it seems like is that JD has convinced himself that this caricature of his political opponents, whether it's the left or the media, what have you, uh, is so evil in his mind that it justifies a turn to Trump or to getting rid of some of the principles he used to have so that he can beat this uh, his opponent. I mean, you, you routinely have heard him over the last few years say things mm -hmm. like we need to destroy our opposition. I mean, at the RNC, he gave an interview where he said we need to punish Joe Biden mm -hmm. and Kamala Harris by electing Donald Trump. So these are not aspirational statements, right? These are the uh, the statements of a guy whose anger and contempt, I think, are motivating him uh, to be involved in politics. Man, so that apparently, actually, he, that doesn't even make any sense, Sabs, considering the other interview we heard, right? Right, and then, but but apparently, he referred to Donald Trump as Hitler. So again, yeah, it goes back to what you were saying: like, did Donald Trump select him, or did? You know, did someone else select J.D. Vance for him? Oh, but what's even it's not just that he elect called Donald Trump Hitler. People have to understand. So I don't know if you have the interview, but his old friend of 10 years that he also went to law school with is a transsexual. I think she she converted to a, a, so it's a he now or, or a woman. I can't remember which one she converted into. But basically they were best friends. He talks about her. He writes about her. And he actually refers to her as a lesbian in the book. Uh, and in the documentary and reaches out to her and apologizes in case she was offended if he had accidentally misgendered her. In other words, this person, JD of the past, was considered to be very empathetic. He was sympathetic to the Black Lives Matter cause. He was sympathetic to Mike Brown's situation. He actually said he hated the cops. He said he hated the cops for how they treat him and that he can't imagine what Black Americans are going through every single day. This man was, at the time, would have probably been considered an independent populist, maybe a little bit conservative leaning, which is almost like the opposite of what this guy knows him to be, which is like, oh, he used to make fun of uh, leftists. So like, I would, I mean, and we make fun of liberals all the time. So that's what would make, would make me think that maybe he just has a problem with liberals, right? But the fact that he seems to be all things to all people at the time where it's most convenient, even with his little weird, like, kind of white guy, like white working class stick, like while he's married to an Indian woman, a gorgeous wife, he has a gorgeous wife. But like, even to that stick, he's like, not really. Like, bro, you actually do like brown people and you do like leftists. I don't know why you're pretending that you don't. Because it seems like he is concerned with one thing and one thing only. Well, no, two things. It looks like he has a weird need for validation, right? And he's concerned with being as successful as humanly possible, which obviously ties back into the first thing, which is a need for validation. Yeah, and I, I started watching the movies on Netflix, by the way, for people who don't know. Hillbilly uh, Elegy, that's his documentary or his his biopic. That's his biopic. I started, weird. I haven't he finished it, it, but I started, I started watching it. And so I had to stop because I had to go do something else. But I could, I already see the theme that's being presented, which is I grew up poor and I pulled myself up out by the bootstraps and you can do it too. And, and don't get me wrong, like what is shown in the, in the movie, it seems like most of his life took place in Ohio. So I know he keeps mm -hmm. telling people he's from Appalachia. Uh, according to the movie, it seems like he grew up in Ohio, not really in Kentucky. Right. So there, there's stipulations about that too. Like people are kind of confused about that as well, but Obviously, from what I'm seeing in the movie, he did not have an easy life growing up. Like, it, just going by the movie, there were obviously issues with his mom and all that kind of stuff. But what is being presented is, look at me, I grew up poor, but I pulled myself up by the bootstraps and I made it all the way to Yale Law School and I worked my ass off and da-da-da-da. But the point I think that a lot of us are making is that no one in this country should have to do that. No one mm -hmm. should have to work multiple jobs and all that kind of stuff. Like no one in this country should live in poverty at all. And yeah. I think but it's, it's weird to me that he had that movie out and it was directed by Ron Howard, believe it or not. 
What? Isn't Ron Howard a liberal? That's weird. But it's a, you know the part that always so in these stories, there's a there's a key factor that always eventually gets left out. And when I see stories like, so he's 39. He's already, you know, had a venture capitalist firm that was backed by Peter Thiel. So he's like, you know, a 39-year-old vulture capitalist that's managed to go to law school, have start a successful business, and become a U.S. senator, and run for vice president. You know what that tells me every time, Sabrina? And you probably know this, too. What does that usually tell you? Where did you start out when you turned 18? Me? In general. If a person has all that achieved by 39, if they manage to have the security, the network, the experience to arrive at this level by 39, generally, where did you start out? The military. They always leave that part out. They left the part where they got to save a lot of money. Their college was paid for. They had no debt going in or coming out of the military, coming out of law school, coming out of college, especially if he was able to retire medically uh, with 100%, which as a Marine who deployed multiple, on multiple tours, he probably did. And so if you if you got 100% medical disability, not only do you have the, the, the GI Bill, but they pay for your law school. I know because they were going to pay for my law school. I, I got a full ride of law school, but they were going to just give me money like to go. I was going to finish with extra money, basically. And that extra money, you can, and if you are a military vet, you also have the benefit of what? The VA business loan. That's a guarantee as long as you have the initial seating money. Yep. And you also have the ability to what? To have a VA home loan. So you have locked in interest to buy your home. I mean, the head start you get from being willing to go and shoot and kill brown people is insane in the U.S. So there's not a, as much as a pull yourself up by your bootstrap situation. It's more so uh, who you're willing to kill and which, how much of your integrity you're willing to sacrifice to get to this point. And I'm speaking, and this is, I'm, I'm, I'm a military vet, so I know these things. And I was, and I'm a paralegal, and my brother is a career counselor in the military, right? So like. You hear these stories and you hear certain patterns and you're like, how old are you? They're not. Oh, yeah, you're in the military, weren't you? Yep. Every time. Yep. It checks every yep. single time. Yeah. And my dad was military, too. So I, I definitely understand. Like, yeah. Same thing with Tim Waltz, uh, Governor Tim Waltz, which I'll get to him in another story later on tonight. But same thing. He was also, you know, military and that kind of thing. And yeah. So for me, it's just like and then there's, there's one more. There's this one I want to play is what? Uh, wait, what from Hotspot? This one just doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> shout out to Hotspot for getting all these because <laughs> Hotspot has been killing it. Listen to this. Hey guys, JD Vance here at Radford, Virginia. I thought I'd take you behind the scenes a little bit. When you get to an event, they've got a ton of crap for you to drink and eat. You got three bottles of Diet Mountain Dew, about a dozen Snickers, a bag of chips. If I ate even half this stuff, of course, I'd balloon up like crazy. This is, uh, this is the energy that powers the presidential and vice presidential campaign. Of course, I'm honored to be supporting President Trump. I'm honored to be his running mate. If you want to help us, chip in $5, chip in $15 to get the message out and to get people to the polls. This election is so important. Your resources help us do the things we need to win it. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, this food is bad for us, man. I, I would blow up if I ate this food. Also, could you just chip in $5, please? Uh -oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Is this how we TikTok, guys? I heard this is how we TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> It's just weird. And then I also want to ask you about the Peter Thiel thing before I get to the, the Amanda Seals uh, statement. The Peter Thiel thing, because I know like people told me when I was out, people were like, Nico did like a hell of a coverage about J.D. Vance, about the Peter Thiel connection and all that kind of stuff. One of the mm -hmm. things that we've pushed for multiple times, I think those of us that are anti-duopoly is that we're trying to get people to see that both Trump and well it was Biden, but now Kamala, both of them are they, you know, they're corrupt. Both of them have mm -hmm. like a certain level of corruption. And as much as Trump said that he wanted to get rid of the deep state, he essentially put the deep state uh, in his campaign. Yeah, and some of the worst people that he could possibly like in his administration the first time. Yeah, that was like, I mean, John Bolton's. I mean, this guy literally bragged. He's like, I, that January 6th wasn't a coup. What we tried to do in Venezuela, that was a coup. That, I tell you, that was a coup. We didn't need it. We're successful. Or what they did to, to, to Biden, I guess, would be a, also a good example. But, <laughs> but <laughs> in all seriousness, the thing is, so Peter, so I have, they're probably referring to my coverage, not only of just 
feel in Vance, but BlackRock and this venture capitalism thing in general. So I have this theory that right now there is an ongoing war amongst the elite. There is the old guard, which is the uh, Vanguard, BlackRock, the, um, the real estate and commodities class, right? Versus the digital revolution class, which would be the Elon Musks, right? The Peter Thiels, et cetera. Trump, people have to remember, technically speaking, the real estate and commodities class, they are his competition, technically speaking. So it would, and he as he has less power over them. He does have some kind of power, but really the deep state runs that more than anybody else, right? Right. So when we look at the war with Russia and Ukraine, they get they're going to get whatever result they want to in that situation, or at least they have been able to, uh, and they've been prepping for it since 2014 because like that's how much control the deep state has over that. Trump has had extreme influence over the digital side, right? The, uh, e even if we look at what's going on right now with Elon Musk in Venezuela, no, all of a sudden X is the number one app in all of Venezuela, right? Top two, top three in the world right now, but number one in Venezuela. And all he is doing is posting fake news about what's happening there and pushing propaganda, right? Now, this is obviously a stance that Trump has taken in the past. Um, and Elon basically just says whatever Trump says and defends Trump no matter what. It ignores Trump when he's wrong. Now, if we saw Zuckerberg doing this openly for the Democrats, we would rightfully complain about it because we're like, what the hell? It's supposed to be a public space. Also, you do there is a there's almost like a, a fiduciary duty to to kind of stay out of the situation because what it looks like when you are censoring certain people, right? But you're simultaneously elevating certain people on a platform that is considered a business to a lot of people. And the people that you are censoring are they have their own businesses and the people that you're elevating also have their own businesses. Now, all of a sudden you are pushing people to say, to speak in a certain way, to elevate certain people and to elevate a certain message in this particular case, Donald Trump. And it looks like that's on purpose. It looks like it's all on purpose. So with JD Vance, the connection is Peter, he's like a, he's Peter Thiel's prodigy effectively. He didn't like Trump. Peter Thiel actually didn't like Trump. I can say for a fact that I know Don Jr. was working on bringing Peter Thiel into the fold since the year, maybe a year or so after the 2020 election. I know for a fact. I, rem I actually had a friend who met with both of them because he's a lawyer. And basically, Donald Trump Jr. was trying to convince Peter Thiel that Trump isn't the enemy. It's actually the other team. Um, and then what we've seen recently with Rumble and everything like that because, you know, YouTube and Alphabet kind of lean more neoliberal, democratic side. Rumble has gone in the opposite direction. And Peter Thiel was effectively a liberal for a long time. Um, so it kind of switched. So now Peter Thiel all of a sudden has his prodigy come into the Trump camp. And J.D. Vance organizes a meeting between Trump and Peter Thiel. And although Peter Thiel has pledged to not give any money to any PACs this year, what's become obvious is that he still has influence on Trump's administration at bare minimum, and that he's even probably had some influence on Trump as of late, especially because it seems like all the, so the Rumble, which is YouTube's main competition, which we would consider favors liberals. Then you have Twitter, which is Facebook and Meta's main competition, which we would consider probably to, to align with Trump. And then you have Trump's True Social, which is obviously his. All those major platforms and all those owners are on whose team? <laughs> Isn't that a little bit weird? I like, guess a little bit weird and coincidental. And so it looks like Thiel is having, not only Thiel, but even Elon, is having influence over Trump's administration. And this might be good in a situation for like perhaps Russia because Thiel's not going to want that war to continue at the end of the day because he's digital. I need Russia. I need that market. I can't have y'all sanctioning the shit out of everybody I don't like. I need China. I need Russia. I need Iran. I can't have y'all sanctioning and limiting my access there. And one thing that Trump is going to do is he's going to open up them, them floodgates for every, every multinational corporation if he can. And I think that is what we're, 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 the purpose of J.D. Vance being a part of that organization. And I don't even know if J.D.'s, or excuse me, this administration, and I'm not even sure if J.D. Vance is as much of a war hawk, war hawk as he's pretending to be. He, but he knows his neocons, needs to, he needs to get as many of the Nikki Haley voters as he can. So he all of a sudden started parroting her. So that's why you think that he's making the comment or 
the video was circulating around that he made the comment that we need to basically go to war with Iran. Yeah. I mean, he's all of a sudden saying we need to go to war with Iran when he's actually been, a, I would say, at the bare minimum, an isolationist since he's been a senator. And now all of a sudden it's we have to go to war with Iran. He supported what happened with Soleimani. He's echoing basically the same justifications that Trump echoed whenever he did. Or he, he says he assassinated Soleimani on purpose, but I still maintain he had no idea Motherfucker woke up that morning and found out like we did. And then he had to go and act. Because if you go look at his... Can, anybody watches those press conferences with Trump after the assassination of Soleimani? He just is blabbering like, yo, I'm just saying, reading some talking points. Yeah, he, you know, he was a terrorist. And then like, like, how did you not know that he was known for killing terrorists? That's just a weird thing to miss. And then like whenever they retaliated and said that we didn't... Uh, no, they threatened us. They, they retaliated and said, if y'all retaliate again... It's all, it's y'all ass. And Trump was like, all right, we'll call the truce then. And that was it. But <laughs> I mean, that's what happened. And it's weird that everybody keeps forgetting how that shit played out. But like, even Trump knew we can't fuck with Iran. But he knows that's what 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 neocons want to hear. That's what neocons want to hear. That's what neocons want. They want war with Iran, or they, at the bare minimum, they want control over that oil supply. They want that government in our control. Um, and so JD Vance is just saying whatever he has to to be the the neocon, uh, at least the open neocon that Trump is most times in the shadows or that he allows his administration to be, even if he won't be openly neocon when it comes to certain things like starting new wars. Mm. Do you think he's going to hurt him in this election, though? I was just looking at recent polls. Kamala Harris is caught up with Donald Trump now. Yeah. See, Kamala is caught up with Trump. And it. I don't know if he could trust the polls, obviously. Um, I don't think, I, I do think that J.D. Vance could hurt Trump in, their, in, in, in basically just because he's not, he can't help him. Trump needed a counterbalance and J.D. Vance is not it. He was, he was not, he just, I don't, he would have been better with Vivek. Vivek is a better liar than, than, uh, Trump is. Or excuse me, not, than J.D. Vance is, excuse me. And almost actually, no, he's also a better liar than Trump is. To be honest, people. Vivek can sell the shit out of Trump's policies. People told him not to pick Vivek or Nikki Haley because they said it'll turn off a significant portion of the Trump base because it'll look like he's trying to be too woke. That's really? serious. Wow, that's crazy. That's you know, it's wild. Serious. So he picked. So he. They said, "Hey, don't pick the Indians. Just pick the guy with the Indian wife." <laughs> so they know you're not racist, and it has nothing to do with that. Or at least, so we can pretend like it has nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> it don't look like he made the decision. What's crazy is it genuinely to me looks like he just was not really all that tapped in to the decision making process of his administration. I think that it maybe was a compromise with the RNC because this time around, it does look different. The Republicans have actually coalesced around Trump. Um, and even the like the Mitch McConnells of the world, which who are like avidly against Trump. Uh, Mitt Romney is shut up. We haven't heard anything from him. Right. All those Republicans who are out against Trump openly have been quiet. So it look even Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham was always like a little really weird wishy washy on Trump. Um, and now he's completely in the Trump camp. So what it looks like is that this might have been a compromise VP. Mm. That's a good point. Well, speaking of VP, that brings me to Kamala Harris. Uh, Amanda Seals has released a statement to Kamala Harris, and this is a complete contrast to what she said in 2020 with the Biden-Harris uh, ticket. In 2020, Amanda Seals said that she was tired of people asking what was their platform, and she said, I don't care what their platform is. I just don't want Donald Trump again, right? Well, now she is saying something different, and this is going around on Twitter, ladies and gentlemen. Shout out to What's the Business for sharing this. Amanda Seals calls out Kamala Harris, part two. For those who don't know, Amanda Seals, she, well, she was an actress. Uh, she's having a difficult time getting jobs in Hollywood now. She's also uh, pro-Palestine. Listen to this. Mm, Put in clips out. of Kamala Harris stating things. I don't need politicians to state things. I need politicians to do things. When I met with Kamala Harris, after she summoned me, I said to her straight up, you talk out two sides of your neck and we don't know what you're talking about. That's for damn sure. I wouldn't be surprised if it's Kamala Harris who's trying to shut me the fuck up. 
Because I told her straight up that I feel like she is disingenuous in her messaging. And she said to me, well, you're being too critical. And I said, I am a voter. I'm supposed to be critical. That's my job. At least somebody gets and somebody. I want to see <laughs> actions. She said, well, how am I supposed to talk about uh, racism in America without talk calling Americans racist? I said, well, first of all, there are many, there are many racist Americans, but there's also policy, legislation, institution, and systems that are racist that need to be addressed. They need to be addressed. And if you're not going to do that in an actualized way and in a loud, bold way, people will never really know where you're coming from. Well, you can't tell me how I feel. So I'm not telling you how you feel. I'm telling you how you sound. I'm telling you how you sound. Okay? <laughs> hey, look. Look, she ain't said nothing slick to a can of oil. The truth is that you should always, always question your source and what are their intentions. And what you all need to know is that I don't need to do any of this. I don't need to talk about any of this. So mm. uh, two identity said she was telling us to shut up and vote. Yeah, she was in 2020. She was one of the people. And now she's complaining that basically Kamala Harris doesn't have a platform. And she, I guess, felt like this administration, Kamala hasn't really done anything. But that's what we've been saying, uh, Nico. Like me and mm. Roland Martin got into it on Twitter. Yeah, because well. I think I said Kamala Harris doesn't have a platform on her website. And he Tell was like, someone, oh, people don't know how to use Google. What, what, what is that? Why should I have to know how to use Google? Why is it not on her website? <laughs> if it's her platform, it's almost like she doesn't want to be locked down in any policy. That's what it seems like to me. <laughs> so then you we, can't go point back to the website and say, well, you had it on your website. <laughs> exactly. And, and what she's saying, what I love about what she was like, there are racist institutions, racist because you can talk about the institutions. You can talk about like the historical racism in redlining. It is a historical fact, but you can also explain how those same policies actually do hurt the white working class community and use that as a unifying point, saying like, yeah, these policies that there are racist policies and they are sold to you as being okay because it doesn't. You think it doesn't affect you in this particular way, but it actually does. And here's how. And if you were if she was this policy wonk that everybody pegs her to be, she would actually be able to articulate this in a way that would unify, especially liberals, and at least make people believe that she's genuine. Because there are people who can disagree with you on certain policies um, that are race-based or race-specific, and they'll still vote for you if they believe that you're genuine. That happened with Bernie, right? We thought that there are people, there were conservatives back in the day. I mean, big, big Trump supporters who like, yeah, man, I, you know, I don't really like a lot of what she says policy wise, but man, I love me some Nina. They used to always say that to me. I was like, are you for real? Nina Turner? They're like, yeah, yeah, I love Nina, man. I love, you know, I don't always agree with her, but like, she's a genuine person. I really like her. And like, they just got upset whenever they like, you can't have all those, you know, you have these stances and then tell people to go vote for Biden or, or uh, support neo neoliberal policies or neoliberal candidates after, which is what they felt like she did. So, like, the biggest problem is, like, what Amanda said, like, you're disingenuous. We have no idea where you stand. And then you, you acted like you cared about racism when you were running on your race. And then all of a sudden, the, your race nor racism matter. So it's like, is it a problem or isn't it? So, and you can make, and obviously, it is a, you can make the argument that it is a problem. But that isn't, the problem is, is you made your entire campaign about your race. If you yep. didn't do, we didn't ask Obama to make his entire campaign about his race. We might have did it, you know, because we was proud at the time. We got a little bit played, you know. I, I I didn't fall for it twice, thankfully, but I voted. For, I was 18 when I voted the first time. And technically speaking, I was in basic training. I didn't even get to really watch the election like that. So I couldn't even have ver verified my sources. But he didn't run on being black. He ran almost in spite of being black, if you, you can make that argument. Kamala 
And then it was running in an environment where she's like, oh, we can use my blackness or, or my new found, my newly found blackness rather, right? And so now, of course, the natural question would be, oh, so like if you're running on being black, how are you gonna help black people? Well, we know what that answer is. If you're, if you're asking me if I wanna do something to specifically help black people, no. <laughs> that's what she said. That's what she said. And then the people like, and then, you know, people are getting mad at us because we're saying, why, you know, do you have a, a black agenda? Do you have an agenda for black people? And people are like, why is that important? I'm like, because that's what she, if you're running on, I'm a black female candidate, da, da, da. And you have no policy positions listed on your platform. Also, it doesn't even matter. Jill Stein has a black agenda. Yeah. You know? It just, hey, it just, question. Is it? So unions that are in very specific situations, isn't it okay whenever unions have a union agenda, like they're demanding a union agenda? Teachers, isn't it okay when they have their own teaching, teaching agenda? Jewish people, they have, I mean, shit, APEC has their lobby, but then there's also just separate Jewish agendas. Even indigenous people in their local elections, they have agendas that they won't follow. Everybody has their own agenda that they demand of their candidates. Everybody yes. does. Lat Latinos, all of everybody, this is not new. <laughs> so whenever people ask for a black agenda, it's perfectly justified. Cause I don't, I mean, yeah, I'm a type of person, I generally try to vote for the best, you know, candidate to represent everybody. But if I'm the average voter, I don't give a damn about everybody else. I'm gonna vote for the three things, the three most important things for my family and myself, which is a logical thing to do. So if I'm black, where the hell is your black agenda at? You can tell me, you know, I just didn't want to, you know, I didn't really think it was that. Okay, that's fine. Well, you didn't want my vote. You didn't think my vote was that important either, huh? That's a, and that's that. Because that's how every other classification and category would handle it. That's right. Do you think she can beat Donald Trump, Nico? Oh, man. Uh, with, the, you got, so here's the thing. <laughs> with the help of the Democratic establishment, anyone is beatable. Because the general election isn't who's the best candidate, it's who can cheat the most effectively and sell it to the public. I mean, that's just the reality of it. One of the reasons that Jill Stein couldn't run for office in 2020 was because she had the audacity to challenge the 2016 election, even though Hillary Clinton herself was saying that it was rigged and that it was, um, yep. there was a bunch of problems, right? So she actually took people to court over it. And the Democratic Party punished her for it, which is even crazier. So she got tied up. But what ended up happening is in some of those lawsuits, she did expose some of the problems with the election system and some of the problems with the numbers that come out. Boom. Now we fast forward to 2020. You got the situation where people always say Trump lost or Trump got cheated or Trump didn't get cheated. But the problem is we'll never know. Why? Because when he sued, it wasn't. People always say, well, if he, if they would have said something, the judges would have known that. Why would they do that? Those are federal judges and those are private corporations who own the, the electronic machines. You have to sue to even audit. So you have to be able to prove that it will be, you'll be justified in auditing something that you haven't even seen because you don't have access. You get what I'm saying? So like, it's really a matter of who can sell the lie the best and who can cheat the most effectively without being challenged, like to a significant degree. And right, and so from that perspective, Kamala always has a chance. The problem is, well, the problem would have been rather, Kamala would have had the debate, but now Trump is running from debates. That's the, so yep. I don't know now. Because I thought, oh shit, if, Trump, if Kamala has to debate, there's no way she's, she can win. And so, but Trump is backing out of the ABC debate because he believes yep. that Demo the Democratic Party is going to replace her, which they've said they're not now. Obama's behind her now. So that's out the question. Yep. And then Fox, she, I, don't, I think that Kamala says she's not agreeing to Fox or she hasn't come out and she hasn't said anything yep. about it. So are we even going to get debates? <sighs> I, I don't know. It doesn't look good to run away. I'll tell you that much. Like, just go ahead and have the debate. Um, but I don't think they're going to replace her. They would be, I think it, they would get a lot of like anger from people if they were to replace her now, especially with how she's increasing in the polls. I just hope a lot of the people that are uncommitted or undecided, I just hope in the end they come out and support third party or independent candidates. And I say that because when people say they're going to sit it out to send a message to the Democratic Party, 
That mm -hmm. doesn't really send a message. The way you send a message is by voting for someone that's, you know, either not a part of the, well, you'll send a message if you vote for the Republican Party too, to be real. But the way you send a message is by voting for someone else. That's how yeah, you send a message. Off. Years later, they're still talking about, well, Jill Stein hurt Hillary Clinton in the 2016. They're still talking about that. So that's, that's true. how you send a message. Yeah. And you know, because they're, because they're shaping their message partially based on that fact. Right. Don't go and vote for a third party because you're going to just vote for because you're effectively voting for Donald Trump. So if it, if it didn't have any effect on the outcome of the election, um, they wouldn't even worry about it. They wouldn't acknowledge you or acknowledge them. Uh, Trump has a problem, though. Trump has an RFK problem. Uh -oh. RFK is taking a lot of his damn votes. There was there was a few polls where Trump where RFK is polling between seven and nine percent. And almost all of those I would say about a good five or six percent of them would probably go to Trump and the rest would probably vote third party or just sit out. So he has a genuine RFK problem, which is why a lot of people were wanting him. They're like, well, y'all both Zionists anyway, so you might as well bring him on. Right. And even though he's been keeping an open line with Trump uh, and uh, excuse me, Trump has been keeping an open line with RFK and he kind of seems like he's trying to throw him a, a line and, and, and bring him into the administration potentially. What it's looking like is that RFK is now so pissed at what the Democrats are trying to do by suing him in every damn state or him having to sue them and spending all his campaign money to just to make, just to make the ballots that he's like determined to stay in now. And it's actually galvanizing a lot of his supporters and those supporters and would, and it, cause they wanted Trump to fight like that after 2020. Yeah, because Donald Trump did call RFK Jr. asking him to basically if he would drop out and join along with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. So it, it, it there's because he's taking so many of that, so, so many of the people who just want something different than the Democrats uh, and that they're willing to believe it's an alternative, even if they aren't necessarily saying that or even if they're not necessarily showing the ideological consistency to be considered an alternative. Like, in my opinion, RFK Jr. has moved to, I mean, he's, people don't even realize he's not just wrong on Israel. He flipped. It's weird how he flipped. Different conversations for a different day. But beyond that, he's not good on China, right? He's decent on Russia now. But what it's showing me is that he just, is just shooting from the hip at this point. And that's not a good look. Basically, he's subjective to, in, he's easily subjected to influence and not the right kinds of influence. And, or he is scared for his life. In which case, it's probably justified, but also, why the fuck did you run then? You knew what your last name was when you decided to run. You knew what happened to your uncle. You knew what happened to your dad. You knew what you did during COVID. And I'm actually thankful for a lot of the work that he did during COVID. But you knew there's a lot of people were still pissed about that. So when you came yep. to this race, you knew what your name was. So if that was what you were principally worried about, why did you even run? And I wouldn't fault you for not running. But now you're here. So at least stand on business, but he's not doing that. So, but all he, but he is taking a lot of Trump's votes. That's what he's damn sure doing. And if and this might be the first time where we see, uh, at least in my lifetime, a Republican lose because of how much influence a random independent populist candidate had. Because this is this is different mm -hmm. than in 2016. Because he's going to end up getting more votes than both Jill Stein and Gary Johnson combined at the rate well, that RFK is going. Except for um, George George Bush Sr. H.W. And Ross Perot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. True. But it was Ross looking like. But so you know, you know, bringing up Ross Perot, uh, there are some people um, that actually believe that RFK was asked to run as a Democratic op. There's there are people who believe that, and at first I'm like, that is crazy. Why would he do that? And people were saying, well, because they can't beat Trump on their own. So they need someone who is Trump adjacent, but won't, is, is liberal enough to attract independent voters, but not extreme, but Trump adjacent enough to take his voters away because they want an alternative. And a lot of people split with Trump over the science juice, Operation yeah. Warp Speed stuff. And a lot of the people that I know that work for his campaign that is the specific and only reason why they jumped ship, right? So 
And then a lot of leftists that were previously part of his campaign before his Israel stance, they obviously were never going to vote Democrat anyway. So it didn't really hurt the Dems. So now we're in a situation where the one who principally, even though the Democrats screwed over RFK Jr. the most, the ones who principally benefit from RFK Jr.'s campaign at this moment is actually the Democrats. Yeah, I noticed RFK Jr.'s poll numbers have decreased ever since Kamala was announced as the, the nominee. He was polling at double digits at one point. It's, it's continuing to decrease as the weeks. And I know he's running out of money. I predicted he would have to end up dropping out because he's running out of money. But yeah. if he does drop out, who do you think he's going to endorse? Uh, I don't think he'll endorse either. I don't that think he'll endorse sense. either. Yeah, he definitely won't endorse the Democrats, but, and you can't, he can't endorse the Democrats because otherwise, first of all, why did you drop out the race? Right. <laughs> so like, you know what I'm saying? Like, why did you, why did you drop out the primary and go through all, and point your finger at the Democrats, de become an independent and then endorse the Democrats after everything you did? He would lose his entire brand and he still has a business to run after. So I don't think that he would do that. And I don't think that he'll endorse Trump. I think that he would stay quiet, but staying quiet is effectively, you know, it doesn't help Trump, right? Those, those voters will likely vote libertarian, vote for Jill Stein or sit out. Or even, yep. it, it, or the laggers, they might go to, to the Dems. Well, there's they don't care about the genocide, right? They don't care about the genocide. And right. RFK speaks a lot to black issues and like issues that you wouldn't really think that he speaks to that well, but he actually is good on like environmental issues. He's good on race issues, better than what people white might perceive. He actually is, supports reparations, which is was always a surprise to me. Like, so there are issues there that liberals liked him for because they thought he had a legitimate chance of winning before he started running out of money. So they might just end up going back enough, not all of them, but enough might end up going back to the Democratic Party. And the the Republic, the the there might not be enough Trump supporters to overcome that. So Trump is screwing himself by not doing that ABC debate. I don't know why he's not doing it. Yeah, I think I think that's a mistake for him. Um, I will say RFK Jr. doesn't support cash reparations. Ca he was oh, he doesn't support that, cash reparations. No, he was asked that in an interview by Math Hofra, and that video kind of went viral because people were taken aback when he said he doesn't support cash reparations because he was like, you "Oh, he slid because he got yeah. attacked for it." Yeah, that's that's what that's what I'm telling you. He said no mm. because it's not fair because you you're not giving it to everybody else, and I'm like, mm, see, but that's group, that's what group. I'm saying. Inconsistent, like you're just going where the fuck the wind blows. I ain't got time for that. Yeah, and B, I just want to comment. B said, no reparations, no black vote. Fuck that third party BS. The third party candidates have reparations. What about saying that? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, what I'm saying. that's the part that's funny to me. It's like you could tell people to look at the platform. They actually have reparations. Well, They're the only people that have reparations yeah. on their platform. That's facts, the only yeah. ones. There's yeah. one more question. One question here for you, Nico. Um, it's uh, from Sir Bikes a Lot Day. Please ask Nico: Did CNN stream the Trump rally live in Pennsylvania during the assassination failure? JD's party played the biggest role in childless families. Ooh, really? Why is he, why, why do you feel like childless families are the because they they fight to make sure people have kids, right? I thought that was the opposite. But anyway, um, did CNN stream it? I don't know. I honestly don't. I feel like every no, you know, you know what? I think they did. I think they did. After everybody, because BBC was there streaming, and the reason yeah. why was because this was supposed to be the uh, like a celebration because the RNC convention was that Monday. So that's that's why everybody was paying attention. So you know, once again, a really convenient time for that to happen but we'll leave. that's a whole different conversation for a different day <laughs> but that's more right stories, jd vance guys he's a problem if you're if <laughs> i know that there might be a few trump supporters that are watching i know a lot of people i know sabi attracts a lot of different viewers if if you are a trump supporter you should be worried because what should have been a slam it's i mean it should have been a slam dunk this started out as a slam dunk election for trump and all of a sudden after what should have been like a guarantee, because like this whole assassination attempt, it made it seem like he was going to be immortal. And 
he picks JD Vance, and everybody's like, okay. <laughs> I, I, do we, I don't know if like people were like, do we cheer? Do we boo? Like, I don't know who the hell this guy is. They're like, he has a, a Netflix documentary. That's not a good start, honestly, because like, I'm not about to vote for somebody who had a Netflix documentary before I knew who the hell he was. <laughs> you feel me? Obama makes sense. To, I mean, and we know why he has one, but Obama makes sense to have a Netflix documentary. Why does J.D. Vance from Ohio have a Netflix documentary as a senator? There are 99 other senators. Bernie don't even have a documentary yet on Netflix. And Obama you know, has a, uh, Barack and Michelle Obama have a deal, a contract with Netflix. Yeah, but you know, them, them, those are the immortal deities of the damn black community still, unfortunately. So like, it makes sense that they have, they, they and they've already did their thing. Who the hell is J.D. Vance? I mean, it's like uh, the daughter, the daughter-in-law, excuse me, of RFK Jr. I don't know if you knew that, but she has a, a documentary about her spy life. She's, she's ex-CIA, she was a spy. I swear to God, this is the one managing this campaign. I'm not even joking, Sabs. I'm like, so hold on, she was super famous and rich before she became his guy. Like, and yeah, but it was just like a super weird coincidence that RFK Jr.'s son met her at a music festival. Like just coincidental, like right as he was about to announce the run. Yeah, like I'm not voting for nobody. I got a fucking Netflix documentary before anyone knows who you are. I'm not, no, I, mm -mm, no, no, no. And it was and, and directed by Ron Howard. Out of all, right? Like Ron, how did you find this man? It's almost as if Peter Thiel made it happen, right? So that now, retrospectively and retroactively, you can go back and now I'm looking, oh, wow, actually, I can relate to this guy. There's, it's like the the marketing. It's like marketing before you knew that you were even going to be looking at him, like that people are going to be looking at him. But he knew. Peter Thiel knew in advance. I would. So I don't know for a fact, but I would make a bet that his documentary is what made within three years old. Is it? I would bet money. Is it within the last three years? All I know is that it just popped up on my Netflix homepage. I'm gonna and look it I up right now. Like, when oh. it was is the it's the Hillbilly eff effigy, right? Or elegy? Yeah. When did Hillbilly Elegy come out? Go to good old Brave browser. Oh, ha <laughs> November of 2020. <laughs> exactly. It's almost like they were planning for this the entire time. Oh my God! In that well, it came out election year, or excuse me, election month. In that bizarre. But I, we never heard about it. Why are we just hearing about it now? Because it wasn't meant for us to be. It, it was supposed to sit there and marinate, so it doesn't look suspicious. Because <laughs> it it would look suspicious if it released like you know a month a, a month ago or two months ago, and then all of a sudden he's picked this as the VP, it also would make more sense, to be honest, but it would still look suspicious. It would look like it was planned. But all the, but to me and to people who pay attention, you know, when somebody has a documentary about them, when they've accomplished, like, oh, he's a businessman. Oh, he was poor. Oh, he was in the military. Okay, so you just describe what? 25% of white male America at 39, 40 years old? What does that mean? What, how is he significant? There's nothing significant about him. Like, I mean, yeah, he's a senator and he, or he's a VP now, or it could be a VP, but like but the circumstances to him be, for him becoming that are actually not all that significant for him to have a Netflix documentary about it. That's my point. Go buy a biopic. Yeah, a biopic. But like, what? But still. What I deserve a biopic more than JD Vance did. Shit. Keep it real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You ever um, had his life threatened? I don't think he ever had his life threatened. Hey, I believe, hey, I believe Amanda Zills about Kamala, by the way. When she says she's not, she wouldn't be surprised uh, if it was Kamala that was trying to get her silence because whenever I, my video started going viral about Kamala in 2019, 2020, that's whenever a, the YouTube guy randomly found me and Fiorella and Pasta at a random event in California during the convention. And he told us, or he told me specifically, and I had called him over because I thought it was insane. That he's like, yeah, they're about to flip the algorithm on his head. I'm like, why? They're like, because you're going too viral and you're talking about Kamala. And we're like, what? That's 
He's like, I was what? like, but everybody's talking about Kamala. He's like, no, nobody was talking about Kamala Nico. And I didn't think about it at the time. <laughs> but it was true because the white, the white folk aggressives, the latte liberals, they were a little bit hesitant to go hard at Kamala because she was a woman of color. Yep. And there was no one that wanted to call her out. Also, I forgot at the time that the, my videos at the time that now everybody knows about were so specific because the story was my grandmother hated this bitch. Hated her, Sabby. The, my grandma sat on the phone with me for four hours. My grandma never talked to me. I mean, she talked to me about politics, but it was always really super general. When Kamala announced, my grandma sat on the phone with me for four hours convincing me I need to expose her and dedicate the next few weeks of my life doing so at the time. And so I'm telling stories about like DA stuff that no one had heard yet, stuff about her family that nobody had heard yet. Like I was one of the first ones to specifically refer to the fact like that she was running on being an Indian before. Like she never mentioned being black. I, Cause I found it really bizarre. I was like, there's no way. Like why would we not hear about a black DA, a black progressive DA in San Francisco? You know, if she, especially cause she was replacing a progressive white dude. And it's because, oh, she didn't run on being black. She ran on being Indian and told stories about her Indian heritage and how her aunt used to fly from India to help her campaign. Like, and my grandma was telling me all of this and I was just telling the stories that no one had heard yet except for people from the Bay Area and they were going viral and this dude found me from YouTube. He knew I was gonna be there because we had made an announcement. And he's like, I'm just letting you, I'm warning you right now, you know, get your ducks in a row because they're about to hit you. I was like, that's crazy. And yeah, for those behold. who are not, for those who are not aware, Nico started before the algorithm changed, and like yeah. back then, from what I understand, because even Kim Iverson had talked to talked to me about this on the show before. She was like, when she first started, like she said, she was she just kind of took off, and then she yeah. said, then they changed the algorithm, and it was like, so it didn't used to be that if you search for a topic, like for example, if you search for Bernie Sanders during that time, you would most likely get independent media that would appear yes. first. In there your was a search. time. So there was mm -hmm. a time with Bernie that if you would type in his name, my channel would show up like within the first five videos uh, on YouTube. On Tulsi, there was a time back when I first became her surrogate that I was number one and Tulsi was number two in her own category. And it's because the algorithm used to, used to do this thing where they would suggest 70% of new content to you and 30, so to, or excuse me, they would suggest 70% of your content to new subscribers or to potentially new subscribers, 30% yep. to your subscribers. Now it's reversed. So you can't yep. get the reach that you once had before. They're trying to fix it. My, my guess is because they have some fear about Rumble and Twitter being competition, but that's the, basically it. But you are absolutely right. When I tell you that algorithm flipped on his head, and he, and he warned us. There's a, we did a video on, it's on YouTube still. Uh, I was in the basement of the convo couch at the time, and we were like, yeah, we're just letting y'all know this was about to happen. That's what he told us. Because he was the one, you know, everybody in the partner program, you have your own team. So in case y'all don't know, that's how it works. Everybody in the YouTube partner program has their own team. And this guy was part of the team that helps with, actually, me and convo couch. Everybody on the MCSC network, actually, ended up being put, assigned to the same group, which is why... When we all got demonetized and taken out the, the partner program, we all got hit on the exact same day at the exact same time with the exact same letter, like the exact same email. Yeah. I remember, I remember that. But yeah, I think people just, some people, especially if you're newer, you may not realize that, but it used to be like, for example, if I watched like Nico's show, the recommended video would be content similar to Nico it, and it would be mm -hmm. independent media. It wouldn't be CNN. Yep. Yep. And they, that's, they changed, and, and that's how I found other independent commentators back in the day. But then they changed the algorithm and then it was no longer directing me towards other independent commentators. Yep. It was a monetary issue too, because uh, the mainstream media, I found this out from somebody who switched from uh, YouTube to working for Odyssey. So basically the mainstream media, they were getting the shit beat out of them by independent media. And not for nothing, but independent media was making a lot of money doing it. And they switched, they flipped it and they started, you know, the CPMs, they were paying in mainstream media at one point, like $20, like CPM, which for those of you who don't know, it's a dollar or it's basically the amount, the amount of money you earn per thousand views. 
No independent media person would ever earn this because that's an insane number. But they flipped it on its head and they started paying out mainstream media $20 uh, dollars per thousand views. But the, the reason why they had to set it so high was because at the time, y'all weren't going to watch them. Nobody was. Y'all were coming to watch us. So that was the only way that it would even make any financial sense for mainstream media to be on YouTube and post so often because they were getting so outpaced by the independent media. So it was like a two-folded, it was like a two-headed monster. They were, we were telling the truth and we were exposing them and becoming famous while telling the truth, which they were like, we can't allow this shit to continue. This is too yep. dangerous. So <laughs> they stopped that shit. And then the mainstream media was losing so much money. They couldn't, they were like, nah, we got to stop this. That's right. Well, speaking of that, well, Nico, tell people where they can find you. So you can look me up, Nico House, N-I-K-O-H-O-U-S-C. I'm on YouTube. Uh, you can find me on Rockfin as well. You can also find me on Twitter at Real Nico House, on Instagram at Real Nico House, and on Instagram, TikTok as well. Uh, they be hitting me hard on TikTok, so I don't really post there as often as I used to. But they just took down my Venezuela video off TikTok. Say I violated community violations. I can't remember the last time I posted on TikTok. I'm I'm never good at that though. <laughs> I was never good at TikTok. <laughs> yeah, nah. It's it's. It, I used to. I I I got like thirteen thousand followers on TikTok in like three months, and they were like, "Yeah, no, nah, shut that shit down." Nope, 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 nope. Not having it. Yeah, it's it's the game, man. You know, we're always we're just trying to stay afloat, guys. We're just trying to stay afloat. But yeah, I'm I'm you. I'm mostly on YouTube, uh, rock fan, Twitter. All right, Nico. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, of course. Thanks for having me, Sass. Appreciate you.